Welcome back. Now, HSBC reported results today. Profit missed estimates. It set aside more than $1 billion for customer redress and an investigation into rigging currency markets. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by David Costa. He's author of The Art of Banking. We're also joined by UK banking reporter Richard Partington. Richard, let's just kick it off with you. First of all, what exactly was the biggest surprise in it today? We know that banks, of course, have fines. We know that investigations are ongoing and that they have to put money to one side to cover these costs. Sure, exactly. And I think payment protection insurance here in the UK is one of the big issues that they have set aside in this set of accounts. Another $580 million is, is quite a large number. We've seen that at other banks here in the UK this quarter, so perhaps not too much of a surprise, but it's still big considering that PPI is an issue that's been rumbling on for about three or four years now. Yeah, and that a lot of the banks have actually put it to one side. Uh, David, let me come to you. How concerned are you about what we heard today? Because I guess the, the big problem is that they put, you know, they have this currency charge, but they actually missed estimates. What is the problem? Analysts didn't see this coming or HSBC have been doing a bad job in, in flagging it up? I don't think HBC have been doing a bad job. What we have is a very challenging regulatory environment, which is much more fragmented. For example, in the Forex situation, we know already that they are striking a deal with the UK regulators, but we still have the US regulators and also potentially even the Swiss Competition Commission chiming in into this Forex investigation. So I think in terms of figures, it's very difficult now, given the fragmentation and also the intensity of regulatory requirements that a bank can really uh, do everything. So it takes a bit of time, but I think I think HSBC has done a lot of progress to align and really reach this level of compliance and risk strategy to be leading uh, throughout the world. It's really to, that's one of their core objectives, really to, to enhance and have a top in class uh, compli compliance uh, and risk uh, system. And it takes time. And at this point, I would say it takes us a lot of money because there might be more fines coming to, down the road. Yeah, I mean, you're talking there, uh, David, about number of challenges, uh, increasing compliance, risks, costs. When can we get over this? I know there are uh, you know, a lot of investigations ongoing, especially, as you mentioned, in the United States. But a year from now, can the banking industry actually put this behind it? Or is it something that will, will crop up quarter after quarter? Well, it's very difficult to put the timing on this. For instance, we have seen a Standard Chartered, which had already a, an agreement with the U.S. investigation, now potentially reopening the investigation. So I think uh, uh, it might be just a year. It might be a bit longer. Depend. I think uh, the banks here, in terms of strategy, have to be very proactive in dealing with regulators and try really to, uh, to draw a, a line in the sand and really have comprehensive agreements to finish off as soon as possible. Ideally, it should be a year, but in some cases, it can be even longer because Regulators are getting increasingly more and more aggressive, and also the requirement in terms of directors. We have seen now this proposed in the UK to, be, to make them even uh, criminally liable in case of, 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 uh, of some proven wrongdoing uh, or reckless misconduct. And so I think it becomes a very challenging environment for banks, not just on the regulatory side, but also on the bonus and attracting and retaining talent side. I think really um, the one thing here, though, is this, this is a HBS, HSBC specific question, or is it going to be more broadly uh, across the industry? I mean, at HSBC, perhaps we see the costs going up more than most because they are one of the most complex financial institutions in the world. Um, is it perhaps better for banks now to focus on really areas that they think that they may be better at than others because there is just too much of a risk connected with being all things to all people at all, perhaps? Well, I think HSBC David, want... has started a, a very, very... Go ahead, David. I think HSBC has started a very, very intense uh, uh, process of de-risking and getting out of uh, risky business and risky countries. And so I think in terms of HSBC, certainly it's more, it's more acute because we have this global operation. And so potentially they have to deal with several uh, regulators at the same time. Yeah, at the same time, David, I wanted to get your, your take really on China because this is something that we shouldn't underestimate. We had some uh, discouraging or maybe, you know, the sign of some worrying figures coming out of China today. And some of the other markets where HSBC is very present aren't doing that great either. Well, yes, I think in China we can summarize the situation with having 8% uh, uh, less sales in, in floor space and an 8% increase uh, in, in new space. So I think the real estate, which is really the driver of much of the growth in China, is cooling off. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we adapt to GDP increasing 
pretty quickly in China or very quickly. And so the, everybody now expects some intervention with the government. I think the government in China has to balance this intervention, having uh, allowing banks to lend more with the potential implication that we'll have in terms of bad debts and bankruptcy down the road. So I think the situation will remain challenging in China for a while because we have this cooling off, which can take quite a bit to then go into a re-recovery stage, and especially in terms of real estate, I think that will take a bit of time. Richard, in terms of the investigations, it seems that the U.S. one is the big one. The U.S. one certainly would be bigger. I mean, we had uh, analysts from uh, Citigroup estimating that the U.S. portion of the currency rigging investigations was going to be significantly higher than the U.K. element. I mean, they forecast the total for the whole industry of about $41 billion, which is a, a very big number indeed. And, and in terms of the banks, do we have any idea at the moment of the banks that are most likely to lose out of or, or that have to put more money to one side than others? It in this investigation, particularly in the U.S.? Indeed. I mean, we've, we've seen, uh, for an example, that Barclays, 500 million uh, pounds is much bigger than today's from HSBC. Um, I think that one good rule of thumb has been uh, a euro money survey of uh, the size of market share in currency uh, transactions. Um, Citigroup, Deutsche Bank, Barclays, UBS, all big in there. So they are perhaps the banks that would perhaps be more exposed to this investigation. Uh, so, David, how should investors actually pick their banks? Do you pick them on the ones that are less exposed to these investigations or do you pick them on ones where the economy is a little bit stronger because at the end of the day we talk about fines and of course that's very important but they have to be in an economy where they can lend and continue making money I think one of the recurring elements we see both on HSBC but also in Standard Chart and other banks is that uh, uh, in this uh, challenging environment, a bright side has been private banking. So I think banks which are stronger in private banking and which have already achieved uh, this sort of arrangement with the regulators are probably a better investment at this stage. But of course, uh, it's difficult to pick banks because uh, of so much unknown still there. But I think in terms of sectorial exposure, I think banks which have a stronger um, revenue from the private banking sector are likely to, to be better able to withstand all those changes. All right, guys, thank you so much. David Costa, their author of The Art of Banking and our banking reporter, Richard Partington. Now coming up on the program, what's under the hood?